started. I'm Ole Broberg from ETU Management Engineering. I will serve here as a chair of man of this PhD defense session. And I'd like to welcome you all. And before explaining the program and what are going to happen today, I will welcome the leading people in this defense here. First, and by all, I want to welcome Pedro Paragas, the PhD candidate. I'll get back to his lecture in a few minutes. Also, I would like to welcome the assessment committee, which has three members um, from the INSEAD in Singapore. We have Manuel Sosa. Hello, Manuel. <laughs> Uh, from NTNU in Norway, we have Martin Steinert here. And as the chair of the assessment committee, we have Tim McAloon from DTU Mechanical Engineering. Yeah. Also, I would like to welcome the supervisor of Pedro's PhD project. This is Anja Meyer from the Engineering Systems Group in DTU Management Engineering. So, what will happen today? Uh, in a few minutes, Pedro will start giving a lecture of about 45 minutes. After the lecture, there will be a short break. Um, and after the lecture, the assessment committee and the members in the committee will start questioning and having discussion with Pedro about the project. Um, and the time frame is that, at most, we have to end no later than 4 o'clock. Maybe we will finish a little bit before. But that's the final deadline for this uh, session today. So again, welcome to Pedro. Pedro will give a lecture entitled A Network Perspective on the Engineering Design Process at the intersection of process and organization architectures. Um, and as you can see, the PhD has been carried out in the DTU Management Engineering Department uh, within the Engineering Systems Group. So Pedro, you have about 45 minutes for your presentation. So please. Thank you, Ole. Um, I hope it's working, the microphone, okay. Um, so, welcome, first of all, to all of you. Many thanks for being here. Today, I will present uh, some of the highlights of my works that started since December 2011, hopefully in uh, very simple terms. And um, it's mainly about how do we support the design process of engineering systems. So, this is the topic today. And uh, before starting, I would like to acknowledge uh, some people that made this work possible. First, Anja Meyer, my supervisor, uh, all my colleagues at the Engineering System Group, uh, and many other people at DTU at large. Um, I would also like to acknowledge one of uh, the co-authors of, of one of my papers alongside Anja, Stephen Eppinger. And uh, finally, very importantly, my two case studies, one of them seated here in the room, who supported this research through data and time and, and make uh, the empirical side of this possible. So thank you all. Yeah. Pedro. OK. Pedro. Yeah, I think we have uh, something related with sharing a screen. Um, yeah, it is. Pedro, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, but uh, um, so I think there was something on the screen. I couldn't see the slides. OK, just give me I, one I have a copy second. of the slides with me, so that's not a problem. But, uh, but if it's just something that can be fixed very easily, then, then let's try. Yeah, I think we have a last minute problem with the system here. So let me see if we Means, can fix uh, it quickly. Um, doesn't seem to want to switch into right. into the slides. Sorry, it's, it's all right. I have I have copies of the slides, so and I see I will see from the camera the slides that you are in, so I, I can actually I will follow. Okay, something happened there. Right. Sorry about that. We will continue. So, okay. the outline of today's presentation I start with an introduction, 
then I will move to the network process framework, which is the main contribution of my PhD thesis, and is composed by a conceptual model and an analytical method that allow us to quantify this conceptual model. Then I will move to the framework application, so I will show you a particular instance in which we applied the framework, and then we will move briefly into discussion and conclusions. To introduce this, we will start by why at all we are looking at this topic, so the motivation and the research approach I follow. A key issue that motivated this research is that engineering system projects often fail to be on time, on budget, and meeting specifications. And this happens even when there are plenty of resources available and when we have great engineering teams behind them. And this happens with things such as the design of airplanes, large engineering uh, energy pro projects, and many other types of projects. This means that um, sometimes large amounts of resources are, are wasted, and uh, the PMI, the Project Management Institute, in fact, estimate that 44% of engineering system projects fail to meet their goals. This translates into around 10% of resources wasted uh, when we go about designing these uh, engineering systems. And this not only affects um, things like being on time and on budget, and it's not just about minor quality issues. It also translates into large societal impacts, like the one we see on a screen. Just to give you an example, if we think about um, the Boeing 787 and many other projects like that one, is it about the technical complexity of the product per se? Is it about the quality of the people working? To try to clarify some of the issues, we can move to the, the last report that uh, last year the Federal Avi Aviation Administration um, showed some of the causes that they think are the real reasons why things, ch things fail. And uh, they say it's not about the novelty of the technologies, and it's not about the complexity of the system per se, but the design process by which those technologies were integrated. And I am quoting Bervatin here. They talk about inadequate communication of requirements, unclear ownership of design requirements, and established design review process not being followed uh, when designing requirements cross organizational or design boundaries. This kind of makes us think that the importance of examining design process, the design process of engineering systems is paramount, and in particular, the people and how they shape and implement complex design processes. To understand these complex projects, we can think about three domains. We have the process domain, where we see activities and tasks and their interdependencies. We have the organization domain, where we see people that implement those those design processes and their different attributes, the different departments in which they work, and we have the product, which in itself is quite a large, complex system. What makes this thing difficult is that, in fact, these three domains are interdependent, each of them with their own architecture and dependencies within and between their architectures. It's in this sense that we can think of design as a complex socio-technical system of information transformation, where we move from sometimes ill-defined requirements, and we exchange and transform information to turn it into something that should be the final details, um, uh, detailed designs for, for the final product. Now, talking about the architecture of these domains and focusing in particular in the process, when we start analyzing the architecture, we see that in, in the first moment of the project, we can plan the architecture we can see a logical relationship between tasks and activities, and we can see uh, this about, uh, in terms of structure and composition, and in particular in terms of also of resource allocation. Once we have that decided, we see that people actually start implementing the process. And by doing that, there, we can start observing behaviors, interactions, information flows. And, uh, these interactions, these information flows, determine, at least in part, the performance that we observe in terms of efficiency and effectiveness of the process as a whole, but also of individual activities. It's in this sense in which architecture is very important, because if we follow this logic, then architecture determines performance. Of course, it's not all that simple. 
when people do things, when behavior arises, architecture continuously, continuously evolves, so it changes over time. And also, when we see that the performance that we obtain is not what we wanted to, then we might want to revise the original architecture, and we want to redesign the architecture. In an ideal world, we will be able to establish the relationship between architecture and performance, between the actual architecture and performance, and also be able to eventually even um, anticipate when problems arise through an observation that doesn't need to see first a, a problem or an issue, but can intervene before that happens. Unfortunately, the actual process architecture is something that is still um, a bit of a challenge in terms of, of research and industrial practices. Talking about architecture, we can think of architecture and in the thesis, I, I push it in, in this way, the idea that architecture has two big uh, and important parts. One is composition. So the elements of the system, their attributes, um, we can count them and we can characterize them independently. But the same uh, architecture also has a structure. So the elements of the system, we can see how they are, uh, how they interact, how they become a whole. How, how things happen in this, in this particular system in terms of structure. But this structure is devoid of attributes in each of the elements. It's only when we see both that we can understand the system and we can go from counting to connecting and, and back. If we think in terms of organizational architecture, in composition we will see a number of people, their departments, and uh, this we can understand, for example, in terms of compositional diversity. We know that the diversity of groups affects performance. This might affect things like creativity or the easiness to in which we communicate. So, so that seems to be important. And on the other hand, we have the structure. We know that information flows through the structure, so a structure seems to be important and how cohesive is a group probably will also affect performance. So these two things together seems to be important factors to consider. In terms of the perspectives that we can apply to analyze the engineering design process, a common perspective is to see the design process through a technical process focus. Here, it's mostly about a planned process that is predominantly prescriptive, is top-down, that's to say experts in the company define it, and they use that in order to try to plan and forecast and assign resources. Because this view is top-down, it doesn't have the richness required to go in a multi-level uh, analysis. So it's particularly mono-level. We see the whole process, and we can spot activities in the process, but, but up to that level is usually what we can see. And then it's sequential. We focus in a logical sequence of activities that can take us where we want to go. The other extreme is the one that sees the design process through a perspective that is more network and socio-technical. Here, it's about the actual process. It's about a description of what is going on, and it's much more bottom-up. Ideally, we would like to see from all the things that happen, reconstitute what is the actual process. Therefore, this can be multi-level. We have rich information available. And this, more than sequential, this can be dynamic. It's a constant change of things happening, and it doesn't necessarily follow a logical structure. And in this view, in the network and social technical view, is where this thesis is focused. And it's not about thinking that this view is better than the technical focus, but rather allowing, for example, for the comparison of these two perspectives and empowering visualizations that allow us to have an overview of the process, um, making better planned processes, because then we can have feedback about what actually go, uh, went uh, and happened during the process. And we can um, have better control and execution um, methods because we see what's going on in reality. And finally, we can improve. We can learn about, uh, from our own behaviors. To get to this point, I draw from different theoretical perspectives and research areas. One very important one is the design process through engineering design or through an engineering design kind of theoretical background. And here I draw especially from the views that see design as a social process that can allow themselves to go into the details of activities and, for example, teamwork. 
but I was also interested in seeing the big picture, in seeing how these architectures affect and these different domains play. And there is where I draw from engineering systems and complex socio-technical systems in particular, where their big picture uh, and the systemic level allow us to see interactions that we won't be able to see through, through a very detailed perspective, um, but that cannot afford to go in, in high levels of detail. And then to analyze these complex socio-technical systems, I decided to use network analysis, and in particular, or, or in general, the, the complexity and network science, and because they provide ways to characterize quantitatively what, what happens. At the intersection of these points, there's already some research that serve as important inspiration for this thesis. And my objective here is to draw from all these domains, and in particular network analysis and engineering systems, to contribute back to the design process, um, uh, industrial practice, and, and research. In terms of research questions, first, research question is about modeling, it's about the theoretical contribution. And here the question is, how can we model the multi-level, dynamical, and actual design uh, process architecture of engineering systems? Because there are multiple ways in which we could do that. And, and I wanted to explore one that was uh, feasible and uh, uh, as complete as possible. The second question is about a quantitative characterization, which aims at a methodologi methodological contribution and it's about how can we quantitatively characterize the mold. So we have this mold, how we take it uh, and, and break it down into numbers. And then the so what question is about data-driven evidence and support. How can we connect this quantitative characterization of the actual architecture to process performance metrics? In terms of the research approach, I start with uh, the research clarif clarification in a way that is more explorative more qualitatively, and that was supported by a series of interviews, questionnaires, and in-company observation. This allowed me to check that I was solving the right problem, and that these things were feasible and useful in, in industry. Then I move into trying to identify and gather um, more structured sources of information. First, in the process architecture, I look into workflow diagrams that typically show what is the formal process and also into activity logs and other uh, sources of information that show the actual process as it evolves over time. Then, in terms of the organization architecture, I look into things like organizational charts that show me the formal, uh, the formal organization, but also into internal communication logs that allow me to see communication happening over time. And finally, in terms of performance measures, I was able to gather information about what the company expected to have in terms of performance, but also the actual performance. And with this, I put together the network process framework, which, as I said, is composed of the model, the method, and a framework application, but it's also divided in three different levels. Network activities, which are this intercon the idea that activities have an architecture and we can measure it, and is explicitly connected with the organization domain. Same thing in the case of networking interfaces. We want to see interfaces and their own architectures in the process domain. And finally, the whole process as a network process. This whole constitutes the network process framework. In terms of the model, what we can see is the same three domains that we talked previously, but now in a more structured manner. So we have the product architecture with the interconnect interconnected components that we can see, we can observe in reality, and they are very tangible. On the organization side, the more social side, we can also observe people, and we can relatively directly measure their interactions and, and uh, their, for example, information exchanges. And in the middle, in the process architecture, um, this is not a standard in, in, in all models, but here I divided uh, the process in terms of interconnected tasks, and interconnected activities. In many cases, we see these as synonymous, but I thought it was important to divide them formally. Um, tasks are the specifications of the things that we need to do in order to define, evaluate, or manage a parameter that is located finally in the product. And the activities are the set of actions, what we do in order to perform the different tasks. In this sense, we can logically map each a task with the activity that performed that task. And in order to analyze this, we can take everything to the same level of abstraction and think 
think in terms of networks. So now we can at least compare them and analyze them systematically. And when we have that, we can also think about the three levels of analysis that I anticipated previously. We have the whole network, we have the node, in the case of the product, we have components, in the case of the process, we have tasks and activities, and in the case of organization, we have people at that level. And in the case of the edges, the connections between the elements, in components, we have the interactions between the components, in the process architecture, for tasks, we have information dependencies, these technical information dependencies between tasks, and in the activities, we have information flows between activities, which are different things. And then finally, in the organization architecture, we have information exchanges between people. But as I also said, there are many interdependencies between these domains. And to formalize the interdependencies, I start with the idea that, OK, we have the product architecture. We can see interactions between their, the components there. And we also have a set of tasks that will allow us to define uh, evaluate or manage the parameters of those components. However, a priori, we don't know the interdependencies between these tasks. How we can build them? We can definitely map each task and their parameters to particular components. Once we map them, we can infer and we can calculate um, explicitly what are the information dependencies on the task side. And there are already frameworks that work in this way. On the more social side, we know that there are activities that are somehow mapped with tasks. And we also see people that exchange information. People perform activities, so we know that. And then we can calculate the real information flow between each activity based on information exchanges between people. And in this way, we can compare, on the one hand, interconnected tasks, this network of interconnected tasks, with the network of interconnected activities. And of course, there are multiple other mappings that can be done. But in the context of this framework, this is the architecture that we will use, the main architecture we will use. And uh, in terms of what has been in this research space before, some people study the standalone product architecture, and they map this against, for example, quality in the product. Other people uh, map the standalone organization architecture, and you can also do a similar thing in terms of how this organization architecture affects the performance of the organization or the project. Also, there have been several um, different approaches that map the process architecture trying to estimate the direct connections between activities and tasks. We have at the intersection between the product architecture and the process architecture other approaches that basically map indirectly the, the different tasks through uh, parameters at the component level. We also have between process and organization architecture, the intersection between process and organization, but with focus on organization or alignment, not necessarily on the process. They don't translate necessarily all the information that we have to the process. And then we have a series of other research that looks uh, at the architecture in general. They provide very uh, good resources to, to map and, and uh, connect architectures of different domains. And what the the framework that I propose, the network process framework, is located is here at the intersection of process organization uh, and process and organization with focus in the process. So we will end up with information that is valid at the level of activities and the whole process. So, in graphical terms, how does it look? We have a very simple network here of activities, and we can we want to look inside of the activity and see an architecture, and we want to uh, characterize this architecture in terms of who are the people working there, how is that they are connected, and how they are connected back to the activities. We can do that for activities, we can do that for the interface between two activities at the process level, which is something that is usually not defined uh, explicitly, and we can look, look at this at the whole process level. If we want to now, in a bit more formal manner, see this, um, how, how it looks like, first we start with the uh, task network, and here we have these information dependencies, and we want to zoom in into one of these tasks and see how they are performed. And they are performed through an activity that if we unfold this activity, we will see people exchanging information and connected to the task in different degrees of responsibility. What we can do with this information, this characterization, if we compare the characterization of all activities against, for example, some performance measure at the same level. So we have performance per activity, and then we can, we can analyze this. 
At the interface level, something similar. We can look at how two uh, tasks are connected and how their information dependency is actually addressed. And then we can see this organization architecture, this small network, actually uh, addressing this, this information dependency. And then at the whole process level, we can basically uh, unfold the whole structure and look at how this topology emerges and later on boil down all that information into a process view that now is composed of all the information exchanges between people and their mapping to activities that can not only be for the aggregated process but also dynamic. And this can be compared against a dynamic picture from, from a pers prescriptive point of view in terms of, for example, a, a VE model, a systems engineering model that analyzes the stages in the process. Now to the application of the, of the particular of this framework. The application is, will be in terms of the interfaces and in terms of the process dynamics. I will leave out because of time constraints all the other possibilities, but I'm happy to address them during the questions. Um, the first case study was this pilot case study that allowed me to understand how this could be implemented in reality, what was really necessary, and it was the design process of a flat sheet membrane. Here, I was able to interview all the members of the process, um, see how the product evolved over time, and, and it was a very rich experience, but it was a very informal process and probably uh, not very representative of large engineering systems. Then I moved to my main case study, the design process of a biomass power plant, where the whole power plant, in, in reality, is several subsystems that are designed semi-independently in different teams that sometimes are or have or not overlapping in terms of people. And uh, how it looks this in terms of what we saw before, we have the product architecture, what, what, what we already saw, things like air and flue gas, boiler, electrical systems and combustion systems. Uh, on the organization architecture, uh, in, the, in the main database there were 96 people registered, uh, 49 were considered core members and provided data that ended up in, in a registry of 77 people uh, in, in, the full, in the full survey. And there are 15 functional areas divided by engineering function. At the level of the process, I have four, 148 coded activities, 13 activity groups, and three years, more or less, of engineering design process. Starting with network interfaces. We know that interfaces are an important uh, issue. Several, uh, it's, it's very common to see um, in lesson learned, for example, sessions, people talking about problems at the interfaces. We need to address the interface between this and that. But although they are certainly quite important, we don't have a good way of talking about process interfaces. We can talk more or less clearly about interfaces between two components or two subsystems in the product. Uh, we can do something similar in the organization, but in the process it was not all that clear um, throughout my research, so, so that's why it was an important part of the framework. And here, essentially, somebody can be part of an interface if that person participates in both, both activities, so basically he is the one or she is the one carrying around information from one to the other, he or she becomes part of the interface, but it can also happen that I participate in one activity, another person participates in the other activity, and we communicate directly, and that makes us part of the interface. To start with the analysis of interfaces, we start with the technical part and, and we map information dependencies in this matrix. In this matrix, what you see is that the checks are information dependencies that were detected, where it says problem are areas that had some sort of problem uh, during the, the development process. If we zoom in in this area so you can actually see what's, what's there, um, we can read it in this way. So if we want to see the interface with electrical, between electrical control instrumentation and, and COMOS data, basically we read it as electrical control instrumentation has to provide or needs to provide information to COMOS data, or in other terms, COMOS data requires information from electrical control, control instrumentation. On this other side, here a problem was identified, similar thing. We, combustion system, needs to send information to load plane and layout, and in that process, something happened and uh, that, that was reported as something that could be done better. Uh, here we have a total of 79 interfaces, of which around 15 had problems. In reality, this looks like this. Graphically, we can see 
Each of the nodes in the middle between the two activities, the activities in yellow and the nodes in the middle are the people, each of them colored by department. Their connections between the colored nodes that are in the middle are information exchanges, and they also are connected with each of the activities. For example, we have electrical control instrumentation and COMOS data that need to exchange information in both ways. They have a size of the network of 15, the density of their connection, how cohesive is the network in a scale from one to 100, from zero to 100 is 76 percent. IQV is the index of qualitative vari variation, which, in, in in simple terms, it means how compositionally diverse is this team. And in a scale from zero to one, here we say that the, is 0 0.58. External piping, similar thing. In, in this case, external piping needed to send information to design of steel structures. And here there was uh, one problem identified, size 27, density 68, and, and then uh, compositional diversity 0.62. If we zoom in in one of these, in this case, overall project management and load plan and layout, the whole architecture has a lot of information already. So before looking at this problem through the eyes of the framework, we couldn't see that there was an architecture of people, an organizational architecture of people, addressing the information dependencies between these two sides. Now we can see it. We can see where uh, things lie in each side of the interface. And for example, we can see that load plane and layout has a number of people from the same uh, functional area, very cohesively connected. The side with overall project management is much more sparsely connected, much more diverse. And in the middle, you have project management having a very important interface role. So we can also identify core areas of the interface and the periphery of the interface, if you want to put it in that way. But this is not scalable. There are too many interfaces, so we want to characterize in broader terms and also identify potential links between, between these characteristics of the interface and uh, performance issues. To do this, we need to um, see if there are archetypes of interfaces. So, are there groups of interfaces that share similar features and then check if these features have something, some sort of correlation uh, with, with performance things? Here what I have is I have measures for structure and composition. In this case, um, network size and network density measures of structure, compositional diversity measure of composition. And I run a two-step clustering algorithm that basically allows me to identify quantitatively if such clusters exist. In this case, what we can see is, for example, in the level of network size, there is a distribution that made us believe that, well, before, before jumping into this, we identify that there are three um, significantly distinct clusters. It could be four, it could be two, or it could be none. Uh, so in this case, there are three. Uh, a has 13 interfaces, B has, thir has 38, and C has, has 28. And in terms of the distributions of these parameters, in terms of size, for example, A seems to be quite high in terms of number uh, of people in the interface, B in the middle, in middle, and C over there. So we have some sort of characterization. This group is high, this group is medium, this group is low, and this is a Relative distribution, if we wanted to see the absolute distribution, it looks a bit like that. In fact, in this case, it's a bimodal distribution. And you can see there is a group distinct, distinctively different um, that, that has this high uh, size. We can do the same with the rest of the parameters. And what we see now is a profile, three different distinct archetypes or profiles of interfaces. The question is, so what? Does it affect something? So to address that question, we need to look at the number of problems per each of these archetypes. And we see that in cluster A, we have 13 interfaces. Out of these 13, we have eight with problems. In cluster B, we have 38, four with problems. In cluster C, 28, three with problems. So intuitively, we know that it seems like a very high proportion of problems in cluster A. Now, of course, you need to test this with something like an ANOVA, and I did that, and it's statistically significant. So we see that this constitution that has a relatively high size, low density, and medium diversity seems to be uh, something correlated with problems. And, and we can uh, create stories about why this might be the case. Perhaps interfaces that are very large and not cohesive are more difficult to manage and therefore more likely to have problems. That's something that we can come up with. 
and therefore we need to explore what is the real reason, of course. This is not causal, it's just correlation. Same thing also with the interfaces that everything went well, because we still have interesting features. For example, in cluster B, we see low network density and high compositional diversity. So it's only sparsely connected, the group, but it's very diverse, and that can create uh, communicational problems and it has a different management style perhaps that is required. Cluster C is the opposite. So we have low size, high density and low compositional diversity. So very cohesive small groups of people that are similar. That calls for probably a different management style. So that's interesting information. Moving into the network process and in particular the dynamics of this process. So we want to see the evolution of the process over time in terms of information flow. The, the logic here is that we have stages. These design processes go through different stages. Uh, we can put it in terms of the B mold, the, the system engineering B mold, but we can think in terms of, of any sort of design stage. We know that these stages somehow exist. And uh, we want to see first the architecture of this process at each of these stages, and then try to measure quantitatively if there are differences that, that, that allow us to spot something interesting in, term, in terms of patterns. And, and for doing this, we need to first come up with some sort of theory about how information flows through stages. And using a number of qualitative uh, informations from the, from the theoretical side, I, I say that in the conceptual design and system level design, we will expect probably an information transition that is relatively high. So basically, what we expect is that people provide inputs for this conceptual design from different places. We want that. But we also want some degree of coordination. We want these integrative work activities, or in, in other words, project management, to coordinate, orchestrate the process. That kind of makes sense. In terms of the detailed design, when we enter here, we want autonomy. We want things to be uh, parallelized, because the level of, of specialization here is too high. And hopefully, in conceptual design and system level design, we already took the decisions necessary in order to move here and, and be sufficiently autonomous. So here I will expect low information centralization, things being very modular from the process perspective. Then in system integration, I will expect things to go back to a certain level of, of, of centralization because we need to test the whole thing as a, as a whole system, as a whole integrated system, and that requires more coordination. If we actually look at patterns and, and through the framework and the methodological part of the framework, I, I, I propose a way to measure this through, in this case, group between the centralization. We can see that in the stages of conceptual design and system level design, for the most part, we have high levels of centralization uh, or higher levels of centralization, which sounds about right. Conceptual design in this particular case was a relatively um, a stage with not so many activities not so many things going on, so therefore there is uh, some high level of variation, but all in all, it was high. Then when we move to detailed design, there is a sharp decrease in the overall information centralization, so it looks also, uh, co it coincides when, 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 with what we expected. And then in system integration, the overall centralization also went up. We can do the same experiment when we break down in, for example, activity categories. And here we have three activity categories, integrative work activities, integrative subsystem activities and modular subsystem activities, we will expect that they also move slightly different in the different stages. So in the first two stages, conceptual design and system level design, integrative work activities, we expect to be more dominant, and in fact, they were. Then in detailed design, we expect everything to go down, but the thing that should go up is modular subsystem activities, and that did happen. And then in the last stage, we expect some sort of trend trend towards a high level of, of information centralization, and it did happen, and it happened through integrative work activity. So that seemed to be um, a good indication of, of the robustness of, of the method, although it was just one key study. Now, the question is, did we answer the research questions? The, re the first research question uh, was about modeling. And uh, what I offer was a perspective that looked into the actual and the planned process and allowed to compare and to explicitly separate them, which is not always done. It's a per per perspective that is indeed multi-level with architecture at the level of activities, interfaces, and whole process, and that is dynamic, at least at the whole process level. So we can see this evolution of patterns. In terms of research question two about this quantitative characterization, 
we saw that we can use measures for structure and composition. In my case, I use three, but it's easy to extend to, to many others. And I provide uh, some um, uh, proposed statistical analysis that can facilitate the use both in industry and in research. And the finally, so what question can we provide that are driven evidence uh, and, and support for, for the design process? I, 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 I um, saw this link between architecture and performance. We are not only able to measure it, but in fact, we did discover this link uh, to a certain degree. It, it needs more replication. Um, we can also interpret a bit more directly what is going on, not just through one uh, standard um, network of tasks devoid from, from any other uh, information about people participating in the process. And uh, we did some early validation of this in both case studies, and it seems to reflect what is real in terms of the process. And, and it improved uh, process reflection. In terms of, of broader implications, for industry, I believe that this provides new data-driven support that facilitates planning and management of complex engineering design processes. So it's both for the planning and uh, control ex execution stages. Uh, it can also allow to have early identification of unexpected or potentially undesirable patterns uh, and information flow patterns more in particular. And all these together uh, should provide an improved process overview. In terms of research, um, we can see now that activities, interface, and the whole process, each of them have their architecture that it can be analyzed independently, but it's also analyzed under a whole framework that is integrated. So they are part of the same thing, and they can be analyzed in terms of also their interrelationships. We saw some empirical evidence based on large data sets uh, about relationship between architecture and performance. In the thesis, um, this evidence is based mainly on a combination between questionnaires and, and other um, data sources that were not so large data set. But in the papers that we have in review, uh, this was expanded through email communication and activity logs. And uh, related with this, now we can allow researchers in the context of this frame framework to directly use rich digital data traces, combine it to build a bottom-up model of the actual process architecture. And uh, finally, we also have developed tools to support research. It's a very early prototype net site, but now we're also moving that in the context of my postdoc, where we will use it in other applications, both inside companies, but also in the context of whole industries. Um, in terms of, of uh, this, research, this research, and in particular this presentation, as I said, is based on my thesis, but there are other publications for uh, very related publications that uh, two of them are in review and two, of, two others in, in conference papers. And uh, that's from my side for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. There will be a five minutes break now. But, and remember, in this break, it's your last chance in the audience to notify me if you want to ask a question for people after the assessment committee has done their work. So in this break, you have to notify me if you want to ask a question. All right, five minutes break. We start 10 to 2.